Well, hello, welcome everyone. It is 12.30, time for us to begin. Welcome to our fourth installment of our lecture series in human flourishing in a technological world. Uh, today, it's our great privilege to have a lecture by um, Professor Dr. Thomas Fuchs. Um, again, I invite you to look at his full profile at our, at our project webpage. Um, I'll just briefly say that uh, Dr. Fuchs is Carl Jaspers Professor for Philosophical Foundations of Psychiatry and Physiotherapy, ph Psychotherapy at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. And uh, <clears throat> he has uh, a very important book out I would recommend to you uh, on the ecology of the brain, the phenomenology and biology of the embodied mind, which is really um, Professor Fuchs's um, you know, life project, I would say, to a defense of uh, the, the human person as an embodied, um, embodied self-determined, uh, self-conscious being and how such a defense aligns with the current science, evolutionary psychology um, and the current science about human nature. Um, another really important essay collection some of which is translated, but um, unfortunately not the whole thing. Uh, hopefully they're working on that, is uh, his essay collection. I will just translate you the German title, Defense of the Human Being, Foundational Questions of an Embodied Anthropology. There are some really important essays on uh, the differences between the simulation and reality that we're sliding into, or the difference that we are neglecting at present in many ways, that we've been trained to neglect. Um, and, and various other aspects of uh, embodied cognition and so on and so forth. So really cutting edge stuff, really important for our interests, um, both in the class and in more general. So I'm really grateful that uh, Professor Fuchs is with us at this sort of ungodly hour in Germany at this time. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you very much for being with us and I will give you the floor uh, for your presentation. So today the title was um, Cognition and Psychiatry in a technological world. So thank you very much, Tom, uh, Tom, uh, Professor Fuchs, and I invite you to give us your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jens, uh, also for the kind introduction. By the way, the book you mentioned, you mentioned last um, will appear in English as well um, by the end of the year, so in defense of the human being. And in fact, uh, part of this book is part of is also uh, appearing in my talk uh, this evening. Okay, let me see if that works. Everybody sees the slides, uh, the, the 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 screen. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, so, um, transhumanism, embodied cognition, and psychiatry will be my talk, and the topic of my talk today, and. Uh, I start with a quotation by Fyodor Dostoevsky, um, Notes from the Underground. We are oppressed at being men, men with a real individual body and blood. We are ashamed of it. We think it a disgrace and try to contrive to be some sort of impossible, generalized man. Soon we shall contrive to be born somehow from an idea. While this quotation from Dostoevsky seems prophetic, being an ordinary person made of flesh and blood becomes more and more a defect. In the face of our machines, we begin to be ashamed of our own imperfection. We are about to witness a fundamental transformation of the previous image of ourselves. The human being in his existing state of development is seen as fundamentally deficient and incomplete. The outcome of evolution is only a badly constructed, a fallible product growing blindly. Human nature is therefore changeable and it is also in every sense in need of enhancement. Further aspects of this change of our image. Dependence on bodily preconditions appears to be ever less acceptable. Our bodies are fragile, vulnerable, subjugated by age and frail. Mortality is the greatest imposition that nature has in store for us. So what is propagated are various forms of the optimization and upgrading of the body, 
the technological remodeling of human nature and even the overcoming of death. Now, for the last two or three decades, uh, such ideas have found increasing prevalence under the term transhumanism. Transhumanists see the opportunity to optimize human nature and by bio, nano, and computer technologies. So each person should have the right to define and expand his psychic or physical capab capabilities, his sex, his appearance, his intelligence, according to his will. And on a still other level, transhumanists such as Hans Morawitsch, Ray Kurzweil, or Nick Bostrom uh, will see the uh, pro predict that we will see the fusion of man and machine. So cyborgs should form the next stage of evolution and lead us to summits of intelligence and life expectancy unimaginable today. Now, such visions extend to the idea of transferring one's mind to another substrate in the form of pure information, mind uploading as it is called, so we can connect our brain to a computer, do away with our old body, composed of skin and bone, and finally attain digital immortality, as propagated by Ray Kurzweil, one of the leading transhumanists and now uh, leader of Google development. Up until now, our mortality was tied to the longevity of our hardware. When the hardware crashed, that was it. But as we cross the divide to instantiate ourselves into our computational technology, our identity will be, will be based on our evolving mind file. We will be software, not hardware. And thus, transhumanism radicalizes a few of the human body that is widespread in the life sciences and the humanities, in fact. That uh, is the conception of the body as an objectifiable, objectifiable vehicle or apparatus external to ourselves, subject to our free disposal and manipulation. Um, this mechanistic view of the body is the counterpart to the functionalist view of the mind as pure information or software. Transhumanism is thus based on a radical dualism of body and mind. But what it wholly misses is a fundamental structure of human existence, namely its aliveness and its embodiment. Humans, uh, so I will argue in the following, are neither biological machines nor pure minds, pure information but they are first and foremost living bodily beings. So being bodily is not something external to us, but it is rather the foundation of our existence. Precisely because all feeling, perception, thought and action is a form of our embodied enactment of life. Now, a comprehensive defense of embodied human nature uh, certainly demands far more than uh, a far more extensive discussion than it is possible for me uh, in this context. So of the manifold visions of human optimization, I will only single out the most prominent, namely that of mind uploading or digital immortality, criticizing it uh, under the aspects of its functionalism and its neuroreductionism. Um, this vision is, I think, particularly suitable for illustrating and for refuting transhumanism's neo-gnostic image of humanity. But I would also like to demonstrate the significance of such an embodied concept of the human being in still another, namely my own field, psychiatry. And here, too, a brain-centered view is increasingly dominating research as well as therapeutic approaches, focusing on drug treatment, on deep brain stimulation and neuroenhancement as means of directly changing a person's psyche. So does mental suffering really exhaust itself in brain processes? 
And we will see that uh, we will see how this concept of mental illness can be countered by an embodied and an ecological approach. So, as I said, starting with mind loading. What is meant by that? Well, um, the basic idea proposed by Sandberg and Bostrom, for example, is to take a particular brain, scan its structure in detail and construct a software model of it so that it is so faithful to the original that when run on appropriate hardware, it will behave in essentially the same way as the original brain. Actually, it would be the same person as we have had before. And this digital intelligence would then occupy a cyborg or an android, or it would even live in virtual reality without a body, becoming in principle immortal. In support of this, transhumanists usually point to the allegedly foreseeable possibility of connecting the brain to microchips, which would not only further our abilities on an unprecedented scale, uh, but also allow us to gradually outsource consciousness to external structures. Of course, all this is far from realization, and it may forever be a utopia. Uh, in any case, it is adventurous enough to think that we could scan or copy the structure of the brain with its over 100, over 100 billion neurons, and multiple hundreds of trillions of synapses. Uh, this thought even becomes fantastic if one considers that indeed we need to capture not only the structure, but also the entire continuously variable activity of the system as a whole, right up to the transmitter release in individual synapses. So here it is hard to say what should be scanned or copied. One could just as well try to copy a waterfall and let him uh, fall on, at, at another spot again. This is obviously absurd. But let us, such, um, let us leave such objection aside and look at the foundational ideas of mind uploading. Obviously, we are dealing with a peculiar amalgam of materialism and idealism. On the one hand, consciousness is reduced to the neural processes of the brain and thereby materialized. On the other hand, consciousness is considered as the pure form of this process, namely as the pattern of information, which can in principle be completely detached from the substrate and transferred to other carrier systems. And this functionalism is nothing else uh, than an idealism of information. However, both assumptions, the materialistic and the idealistic, are equally blind to the living reality of the embodied person. And in the following, I criticize first the functionalist and then the neuroreductionist prerequisite of a transfer of consciousness, of mind uploading. The idea of mind uploading equates the mind with the totality of algorithmic processes in a complex system such as the brain, in other words, with software. And this corresponds to the common concept of cognitive science as well as artificial intelligence, namely functionalism. And here, mental states feelings, perceptions, thoughts, etc., are defined through functional, uh, through functional connections of input and output of a system. So someone who stabs his finger, for example, enters a mental state which leads to moaning and the withdrawal of the finger. Pain, then, is nothing other than the state of the brain which results in this output. And this state can be described as a certain amount of data. Consciousness is thus the byproduct of a neural calculation of an algorithm. 
The process of uh, the progress of artificial intelligence has granted functionalism an enormous boost. And the power of human intelligence uh, doesn't seem to be bound to the brain, let alone to consciousness. Well, of course, no artificial system has the faintest idea what it calculates and what it does. Obviously, the decisive feature of pain, feeling or thought is lost in the functionalist conception, namely experience. John Searle's classic Chinese room argument still remains relevant or even more relevant today. Uh, even an artificial system, he shows, an artificial system that can translate Chinese perfectly or can find the matching answers to all questions in Chinese according to its program, still such a system does not understand a single word of Chinese. Meaning cannot be reduced to functional algorithms if there's no conscious subject who understands what these algorithms actually mean. But the same applies to pain, to, ta to the taste of chocolate, or the scent of lavender. No qualitative experience as such can be derived from data or information. Conscious, consciousness is not the mindless traversal of states of data. At core, it is self-awareness. It is for me that I feel pain, that I perceive, understand, or think. And this self-awareness is not based on reflection. Rather, it has already characterized my primary experience, such as when thoughtlessly dozing in the warm sun. It is a basal sense of self that forms the background of all our, all our experiences a feeling of being alive that springs from our whole body and manifests itself in well-being or in this or in disposition more specifically in hunger thirst pain pleasure and similar uh, feelings there is nothing to suggest that this vital sense of self can be reduced can be reproduced in digital algorithms let us take the example of pain only. The unpleasurable quality, so the painful element of pain, cannot be expressed digitally in zeros or ones. Digital information does not carry any values. All digital signs or physical states are only pure facticity, externality. All digital signs um, are, are nothing else than that. In other words, the core of consciousness, which makes us feeling beings in the first place, cannot be grasped by information theory. It is inseparably bound to our corporal sensing and therefore also to our biological existence. And whatever we take from the human brain in terms of data or information in order to copy or transfer it to an artificial system of processors and circuits, the outcome would only ever be sheer externality. An Android or cyborg programmed with such data would in the best case be an unfeeling zombie. Now immortality is generally, is generally conceived a little differently. But let me go to the second prerequisite of mind uploading which is the identification of brain and person. In a typical formulation, all that makes up a person, such as their mind, their consciousness, emotions, memories, their identity, is physically saved in the structure and the processes of the brain. Now, um, this reductionist, uh, neuro-reductionist view widespread today is crystallized in the thought experiment of the brain in a vat. A brain removed from the body by a fictive neuroscientist could be kept alive in a nutrient solution and be fed appropriate information by a supercomputer such that it could produce the same experience, the same world, that even the same self 
as it allegedly does now. So we would not notice the difference. And this is because our experience, so runs the argument, is nothing other than the data structure in the brain itself, no matter where the brain is fed from. So what is the counter argument to this? Well, the brain is not a closed system which only receives input and issues output. It is much rather continuously engaged in circular feedback interaction with the body and with the environment. And it is only through this constant interaction that conscious experience comes about. Now, this is the core tenet of the paradigm of embodied, con of embodied cognition. It regards consciousness and subjectivity as essentially embodied in the whole organism, so not only embrained. And as situated and enacted through the ongoing sensory motor interaction of organism and environment. And thus the mind is not regarded as an inner model or mirror of the world produced inside the brain. But it is a, a regarded as a particular enactment of the life of the organism as a whole. I have already mentioned a primary, still unreflected experience, the vital sense of self, the feeling of being alive. Now, this does not arise um, from the uh, first in the cortex, but it results from the continuous vital regulatory processes which involve the whole organism and which are integrated in the brainstem and higher centers. The maintenance of homeostasis, the inner environment and thus the viability of the organism, this is the primary function of consciousness as it manifests itself in desire, hunger, thirst, pain or pleasure. The integration which underlies conscious experience is based on continuous circular feedback between the basal areas of the brain and the whole body. And therefore conscious experience is not an image in the brain, but it rather always includes the organism as a whole. And this can also be expressed in the following way. All experience is a form of life. Leben is uh, the basis of Erleben, of experience. So without life there is no consciousness and no thought. And the same way, emotions are also bound to the constant interaction of brain and body. So moods and feelings always relate to the whole body, to the, not only to the brain but also to the autonomous nervous system, the heart, circulation, breathing, muscles, facial expressions, gestures, and our position, our bodily stance. So every emotional experience is inseparably bound to changes in this whole bodily landscape. And the same, of course, is true of all perceptions and actions, which result from the sensory motor interaction of brain, organism, and environment. In other words, from functional circuits involving our senses, our limbs, and equally things, and of course, other people. The brain is capable of integrating all of the organismic functions, but it is conversely reliant upon them. So it is not a command center which receives information and issues orders, but it is rather a resonance, a relational organ, a part of the functional whole of body and environment. It is easy to see that the brain in a bad thought experiment here fails. Even an extremely complex computer could never simulate the homeostatic self-regulation of the whole organism. All of the interconnections of neural and physiological processes that involve the whole body. These processes are of a biological and biochemical nature and cannot be represented in digital format. And nor could a computer simulate all of the circular interactions between, between brain, body, and environment on which our experience of the world is based. Conscious experience presupposes corporeality and thus biological processes in a living body.
A disembodied brain is as much of a functionalist fiction as mind uploading. Against such cerebrocentrism, we may set the paradigm of embodiment. Consciousness is based on the continuous interaction between brain, body, and environment, and therefore it cannot be considered localizable at all, neither as an internal state in the skull nor as data pattern in the brain. It is the overarching activity of a living being in its relationship with the environment. So it is humans who feel, perceive, think, and act, not brains. Let me once again turn to the basic idea of mind uploading. It is even clearer now that behind the transhumanist visions, there stands a concept of humanity as reductionist as it is dualistic. The phantasm of the fusion of mind and technology is an expression of a neglect, even of a contempt for life and the living body. Freeing the mind from the material body is the promise of transhumanists. Ultimately, they are secular epigones of the neoplatonic and Gnostic teachings about the body as a grave or a dungeon of the soul. So for them, the mind must be freed from the body because we are only contingently trapped in mortal vehicles. Against this, we can posit the concept of embodiment, that bodies are not prisons and minds not pure spirits, but that both are indissolubly entangled in one another. The mind can never be removed from the body and transferred to a computer. Our conscious experience, just as our personal identity, is based on the living body that we are. And this embodied, and therefore, of course, mortal individuation is the price we have to pay in order to experience the possibilities and the freedom of earthly existence. So far, my first part on mind uploading and transhumanism. In my remaining part, I would like to demonstrate the significance of such an embodied concept for the field of psychiatry. Uh, because here too, a brain-centered view is increasingly dominating research as well as therapeutic approaches focusing on drug treatment, deep brain stimulation, and neuroenhancement as means of directly changing a person's psyche. Mental disorders are dysfunctions of brain circuits. That is the guiding principle of biological psychiatry today. Since the first decade of the brain from 1990 onwards, great hopes have been placed in this paradigm and ever new decades have been propagated. Neuropsychiatry would soon be able to explain and diagnose mental disorders as brain dysfunctions. And on this basis, it would be possible to develop highly specific medications and even identify risk individuals for preventive treatment by means of genetic screening. But after three decades, the result of brain research is sobering, to say the least. Despite all promises and billions of neurons of invested in research, hardly any clinically relevant findings have been brought to light. There is still no way to reliably diagnose psychiatric disorders by means of instrumental examinations or biomarkers or to assign them to specific gene variants. Nor have therapeutic procedures changed in any, in any relevant way on the basis of neurobiological findings. Well, all this is now acknowledged even by high-ranking representatives of neurobiological research. I just mentioned two, um, Crystal and State. Despite obvious and rapid scientific advances, there is widespread frustration with the overall pace of progress in understanding and treating serious psychiatric illness. And despite decades of research, the neurobiology of major depression is largely unknown and treatments are no more effective today than they were 50 to 70 years ago. And I could list um, a, a lot of similar quotes. 
Nevertheless, still new decades of the brain are proclaimed, even a century of the brain, and new therapeutic breakthroughs are announced. However, here one usually refers only to deep brain stimulation or magnetic stimulation, because the pharmaceutical industry has already largely withdrawn from research for the reason of lack of any success. Well, one could really ask whether this, uh, as shown here, the insertion of a deep brain stimula stimulator uh, is really the therapeutic prospect that neurobiology opens up for us. It seems obvious that the guiding assumptions psyche um, equates brain and mental illness equates brain disease are too simple and too reductionist to serve as a satisfactory basis for psychiatry. There are a whole range of objections to them, and I will mention only the most important ones. First, neural and genetic data only ever provide statistical deviations, not diagnosis. Brain states as such do not reveal what is considered healthy and what is abnormal. Only the clinic, and that means the person suffering from mental illness, tells us this. However, the definition of mental illness is thus largely dependent on subjective and on cultural factors that lie outside the realm of natural science. And second, deviations from average brain activity do not as such indicate the cause of a disorder. They may just as well be concomitants or consequences. Similarly, the cause of a grief reaction is certainly not the activation of the cingulate cortex, which we, found, which we find here, but rather a painful experience loss. And it is not the activation of the amygdala which causes fear, but the subjective perception of a threatening situation, and this perception is certainly not to be found in the amygdala. Of course, images suggest their own reality. And so neuroimaging all too easily leads us to a confusion between correlate and cause. But the linear concept of causality of the 19th century, so brain condition A produces disease B, does not allow us to understand the complex etiologies of mental disorders even less so if we fail to take into account the experience of the patients in their life situation. And this brings me to the central crucial role of subjectivity. If we look, uh, for example, at the triggering of depression, then it is usually based on the perception of a life situation as unmanageable and threatening a perception that cannot be reduced to neuronal processes. However, this means that subjective dispositions gain crucial importance for the pathogenesis, including one's self-concept, one's self-esteem, self-efficacy. So the self-experience and self-relationship of the patient is, constantly, is a constantly effective component in the course of the illness. It includes, for example, in the case of depression, negative self-evaluations, depressive thought patterns, vicious circles of um, um, self-fulfilling negative prophecies, which in, in turn increase the probability of further failures. And this leads to negative feedback and vicious circles. And without such circular processes, a mental disorder cannot be adequately understood. And fourth, if, meant, if a mental illness cannot be detached from the person and attributed solely to the brain substrate, it can just as little be considered as a purely individual disorder without its interpersonal aspect. Mental illnesses are caused by unfavorable life events and social influences, and the resulting risk of illness is far higher than genetic risk variables. Conversely, the disorders impair the ability of patients to respond adequately to their social environment. And this has detrimental social consequences that in turn are decisive for the course of the illness. 
All these influences are mediated by neurobiological and epigenetic processes, but they are only taken up. They are not generated by the brain. Um, the processes involved uh, here vary, of course, among different disorders, but we may nevertheless generalize these considerations from depression and say that all mental illnesses are characterized by a complex interplay of circular processes, both at the individual level and at the interpersonal level. So no mental illness can be diagnosed, described, or explained without taking account of the patient's subjectivity and their interpersonal relationships. And this leads to an extended view of mental disorders. They may not be localized in the person, but they are disorders of a, pace, of a person's relation to the world and to his or her relation and, and uh, are, are disorders of his or her relationships to other persons. In these circular processes and interactions, the brain functions as an organ of relation and mediation. Its structure is, however, continuously shaped and modified in turn through these uh, psychosocial interactions. And in this way, subjective and intersubjective experience has a structuring influence on the neural substrate. And this is, of course, particularly relevant for psychotherapy. Our conscious experiences are not just epiphenomena of neurophysiological processes. Rather, the opposite is true. The neuronal processes in our brains are only parts or components of overarching psychological that means subjective and intersubjective processes. Thus, a psychotherapy demonstrably changes the function and structure of the brain over time. And this is because it consists of meaningful processes and intentional experiences uh, in which the brain is involved and by which it is changed, top down, as one calls it. So the sharing of feelings, words, and thoughts, this is what constitutes the healing therapeutic relationship also on the biological or neurobiological level, which is influenced by, this process, by these processes. The brain is an interactive, a mediating organ, but in the brain itself, there is no experience, no consciousness, no thoughts. All this exists only in the interplay of organism and environment. And it is relationships and interactions that form our psyche and our brain from birth on, that create our experience and our common world, and that give substance and meaning to our life. And when we learn today that even an organic brain disease, such as Alzheimer's dementia, can best be prevented through physical movement and social interaction. This shows all the more that we have to understand the brain as an organ of relationships, as an organ of the psyche, not as a supposedly localizable inner world, but rather of the psyche as a comprehensive, embodied and interactive life process. It is time um, to look for a new concept of psychiatry that leaves behind the classical dualism of body and psyche, as well as its neuro-reductionist alternative. Such an integrative concept should enable us to understand uh, the overarching ecological contexts in which mental illnesses develop and how biological, psycho and social therapeutic treatment approaches intertwine. In the current concepts of embodied and inactive cognition, psychiatry could also find a paradigm that understands the brain, organism, and environment in their dynamic unity. Neuronal processes become components of a comprehensive process that can be viewed on different levels. The macro level of psychosocial processes or interactions of persons the medium, the individual level of interactions between brain, organism, and environment, and the micro level of neuronal and molecular processes within the brain. 
So descending to the next level, the selected section of the event narrows down each time. However, the levels cannot be reduced to one another. There's instead, and there's uh, rather a relationship of emergence between them. And this leads to top-down and bottom-up effects as shown in the curved, narrow, uh, curved arrows. Uh, psychotherapeutic treatment as an interactive intentional process on the macro level modifies the brain structures involved top down. The altered neuronal structure, however, in turn enables the patient's interactions with the environment to change. That would mean bottom up and so on. So in the course of time, a mutual influence of superordinate psychosocial interactions and neural substrate develops, or a circular interaction between process, the ongoing process of experience of interactive intersubjective experience and the structure that is sedimented from these experiences in our brain. And in this way, biological, psycho and social therapeutic interventions may start at different levels and components and with different components, but they are interlinked in circles and can also be used to complement each other. It is only important that the circular processes receive a new direction through the therapeutic impulse. From this point of view, mental disorders are always disorders of the overarching processes at the macro level. That means they affect the person in his or her self-awareness and relationship. However, individuals are also living embodied beings and all their psychological processes are also biological processes, not limited to the brain, of course. So a correctly understood biological psychiatry requires an adequate concept of biology, namely that of life bound to the entire organism and its interaction with the environment. It requires an ecological theory that includes social and cultural processes outside the, outside the brain. And only then can it correctly understand the brain as the mediating organ for these superordinate processes. To conclude, the neognostic dualism of transhumanism does no more justice to the embodiment of the human being than does the biological reductionism of psychiatry. We should understand psychiatry as a comprehensive relational medicine, as the science and practice of biological, psychological, and social relationships and their disorders. An ecological concept of the psyche as the overarching form of the relations between organism and environment or between person and the world could substantiate such a relational medicine. Without doubt, all the biological processes involved belong to the terrain of this, to the field of this psychiatry. But at its center is the person in his or her relationship to others, because it is in the patient himself or herself that all the levels and circular processes that we observe, that we explore, and in which we also can intervene, unite, are united in the person. A person-centered psychiatry will always see more in mental illness than just brain disease. The patient's experience are in relationship to themselves and others of central components of the illness. And for this reason, the description of imaging of neuronal processes only ever reveals part, a component of the overall disease process. No psychiatric illness can be diagnosed, described or treated without considering the patient's subjectivity and interpersonal relationships. What psychiatry therefore needs is a systemic or ecological view of the brain in order to better understand the interplay of biological, psychological, and sociocultural processes and thus to do justice to the complexity of its actual subject matter. For this is not the brain in isolation, but the embodied human being 
living in relationships. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>